speech. And, uh, I don't take it lightly. I, I believe the preacher ought to pray, he ought to study, he ought to prepare. And then, like uh, Dr. Ruckman says, uh, uh, prepare like it all depends on you, and then you preach like it all depends on God. I like that. And I think that's a good combination for a preacher. So, hopefully it'll go okay. I mean, I, I believe this is what the Lord wants me to preach. I worked hard, I prayed hard, and if it's Hopefully it'll, it'll be something you could use, something to be a blessing to you in Matthew 14. Now, uh, my style of preaching, if some of you had not heard me, uh, I'll just prepare you, okay? <laughs> I, I, uh, I get excited because I think it's, a, it's an exciting call. I'm privileged for God to let me yeah. preach, so I get a little excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I use a little bit of humor. And some people like it, some don't. I'll tell you what I do, okay? I'll, I'll give you my <laughs> philosophy, quote-unquote, on preaching. I think that God's people are, that when you preach to them, their defenses are up. And it gets worse every, every 10, 20 years. And when you get into a church or a preaching service, initially, their guard is up. See, people are stiff. See, there, there's something about, you know, when the, when the Bible's open and preaching starts, that you need to disarm them a little bit. That's the way I look at it. So I believe I, I use a little bit of humor to try to get people to, to lower their guard. And then I, like Paul said, catch them with a dial. Okay. I could catch them, you know, sneak around and stick the barb in them, but I believe in using humor. Now, I have scripture for that, if you think, you know, we should never use humor in a pulpit. I've heard that before. A merry heart doeth good like a what? A medicine. The joy of the Lord is our what? Jesus Christ was anointed with the oil of what? Gladness above his fellows. So that's why I believe it. I believe it's scriptural. Now, people that don't believe in humor, and we'll get to the message, they have their scripture, you know. It's better to be in the house of mourning. <laughs> no, no, seriously, that, that's, 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 that's in there, okay? Be sober, be, I understand it says be sober. Watch out for foolish jesting, I understand that. And I'm not knocking somebody that never uses humor. I'm saying, you're right for your style, and I believe I'm right for my, we're both right, okay? So I, I believe you, there ought to be a balance there. There isn't any one way to preach, as long as you're preaching the same book. You do it your way, and I'll do it my way, but don't shut a preacher up because it isn't your style, okay? Amen. 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 If somebody comes up here and just, if the house of mourner comes up here and just, you know, nothing but negative, I'm still going to try to get something from it because if it's scripture, it's scripture, okay? So, and I, I, I have some role models for humor. I, I have people that that I've watched their preaching and I've listened to them. Dr. Ruckman, he uses humor, does he not? Sam Jones used humor. Billy Sunday used humor. You ever heard of Jim White from Ohio? <laughs> and I'll tell you what, those guys get the job done. So don't try to corral preaching in it. If it isn't your style of preaching, it isn't preaching. It develops different kinds of ways to preach the book, okay? Hey Amen. That was like a commercial. We shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14. Let me get some of this stuff out of the way. Now, I was trying to uh, pray about what to preach tonight, and I'm going to preach something that I hope it's not, you know, I'm not going to get spooky and charismatic on you. And I'm not, but at the same time, we Baptists sometimes, and I say we, because I'm included, sometimes we discard the miraculous like that was the Old Testament. And God used to think, and in the book of Acts, God did miraculous things. But sometimes we get to thinking, well, God's done working miracles in 2012. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think God has changed at all. He might use a little different, but he's still a miracle working God. I'm going to give you a challenge tonight. And I'm going to preach about water walkers. Water walkers. Matthew chapter 14. Now, I, I, I hear this all the time. I don't like to use this phrase, but it, the preachers use it. You, you know the story, I'm sure. I hate to use that, but you folks do. But let's look at Matthew 14, 22, and I'm going to skip some of it. Matthew 14, 22, and straightway Jesus constrains his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now we're going to get rid of some, we're going to skip some of this, not get rid of it. <laughs> but you know it's boisterous and it's windy and they're all afraid and stuff like that. So let's get right to the text that I'm going to use. Uh, verse 28, uh, Peter answered him, he answered the Lord, and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Verse 29, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Let's pray, Lord. I pray my blessed message, Lord, and I pray, Father, that you might help us to find a balance here. Uh, between the miraculous and the practical, but help us not to let the practical keep us from acknowledging that you are a miracle working God. I pray, God, that there might be uh, something in here for everybody, Lord. I pray, God, there might be something for me and something for everyone here. And I pray, Father, you might teach us some things from Peter's example. 
Please fill me with the Holy Spirit and bless the message for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to talk about water walkers. Now, as far as I can tell in the Bible, and you can correct me later, don't correct me now, but <laughs> correct me later if I'm wrong. As far as I can tell in the Bible, this is the only time that a man walked on the water. Now, of course, Jesus walked on the water, but he was God, okay? He was God and man. But as far as I can tell, this is the only time a 100% human being, a man, walked on the water. Now, the Jews crossed over on dry land, right? Red Sea. But they didn't walk on the water. There's an angel in Revelation, I think it's Revelation 10, a mighty angel, who comes down from heaven, and he stands with his left foot upon the earth and his right foot upon the sea, so he's not walking on it. He's standing on it, but he's an angel, okay? He's not a human being like me and you. And uh, in Joshua chapter 3, the priests bear the ark, they dip their toes in the brim of the water, and then God got the water out of the way and they walked over, but they walked over on dry land, see? But this is the only time I can tell in the Bible where a man walks on the water. And what guy does God choose? He chooses Peter, a cursing fisherman. He's about as human a, a, of the 12, the 12 apostles you can find. He's human like, he's a sinner, you know that? He's a man subject to life. He denied the Lord three times. And God said, you know what? That's the guy, and I'm going to let him walk on water. You know, Peter gets a bad rap here, and then we'll get into the message, because most preachers highlight the fact that he went down and sank. And he did sink. But it says in verse 29, look at the end of the verse, it says, he walked on the water. You go to Jesus. He did it. You know, some Baptists that just won't believe in, in God working miracles, some Baptists don't believe that. They read that, you know, and their eyes get kind of fuzzy, and they say, Walked on the water, but he was in, he began to sink. No, he walked on the water, okay? <laughs> then he began to sink, didn't he? You know, I read uh, I read uh, different books about missionaries and stuff, about Christians of the bygone era, and God had some water walkers in, Christ, in the Christian era. You know that? He had some men and women that, you know, not literally walked on the water. You know what I'm saying? Spiritually speaking, they did things that looked impossible, but with the help of God, they did them. Yeah. What happened to those people? Where are they at? You ever ask yourself that question? Amen. Well, you know, it's, that's just, you know, that's this church era history, and this is the, you know, there's the seven churches. You know, you can divide your Bible so much that after a while you can just shove God right out of that thing. You know that? Right. I think God can do just about what, I think he can do whatever he wants as long as it doesn't come through the scripture. I think there's still a space for people like William Carey. William Carey said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God, amen? amen. So what do you do? Oh, not too much. He was the father of modern missions. He taught himself six, lang six languages on a cobbler's bench. He translated the 1611 AB Bible into 44 languages and dialects. You know what I said? I said he was a man who walked on water, spiritually speaking. He did the impossible. Can God still do that? I think he can. I think he can. I'm not looking for a national revival. I'm not saying that. I'm not looking for a citywide campaign revival. But God can do things in an individual and through an individual and to an individual, can he? Why can't he? You know why he can't sometimes? Unbelief. That's the problem. It's our unbelief. In, you know, and I'm going to uh, get into the message now, but in your Christian life, I want you to think of this as we're going through the message. I want you to think, maybe there's something I can do that God wants me to do. But I've just been afraid to try. You ever thought that? Just been afraid to claim a promise or step out by faith or just, you know, Go into that thing knowing what you're going into and God wants you to do it and let God work the miracle and see if God can do something through you. I want to challenge you to do that. You know why people go to the mission field? Because they get a hold of something and they believe God can do it and if they're honest with themselves, they look at themselves and say, I can't do it. I can't do this too much, but God wants me to do it. He's called me there and I'm going to claim the promises by faith and I'm going to go do it and see what God does. You know what that is? That's a water walker. They're still around. Billy Sunday, Hudson Taylor, Gladys Aylward, William Borden. Whatever happened to those guys? Well, they, God used them, and I think God wants to use some of us, too. You know that? Let me say this about water walkers. People that do great things for God or let God do great things through them, I should say. Okay? Number one, not too many folks are willing to try. Not too many folks are willing to take a step of faith. Amen. Now you look at these apostles. Look at verse 26. It says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. If you look at another passage, I think it's Mark 6 and John 6, they all saw him. They all saw Jesus Christ walking on the water. How many went out and took a step of faith? Just one. Just Peter. I'll give you a modern example. I don't know what the statistic is, but the statistic on soul winning and witnessing among professing Christians is very small. Very small percentage of Christians witness. 
and a very small percentage of those professing Christians that even try to witness are actually soul winners and winning souls to Jesus Christ. And you know why some of you don't witness if you're not a witness for Christ? I'll tell you why. Wait, what do you think the number one reason is? Fear. Fear. Yeah. Good example. Can I use this example? Okay. Here's, here's, here. He's going to knock on the door. He's going to give you that track. And here's what you think is going to happen if you're not if you're not trying to be a soul winner, but it almost never happens. Okay, you're not going to do it. What do you want? What is the track in the Bible? What gospel track in the Bible? I don't see that. You, you know where they're at? Some person, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me some person on internal security? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, that's okay. And then what about the Hebrew and Greek? Isn't wasn't the Bible written in Hebrew and Greek? This is in English. What's the deal? Can you explain that? Yeah. Okay, explain it to me really very quickly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay, likely story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he came <to> his wife. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> and see, we know what some of you think. Some of you think, because you're in a Bible belt down here, that when you knock on the door, there are going to be Bible geniuses on the other side of that door. That's right. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. I don't think I've ever met a Bible genius, quote-unquote, since I've been in Pensacola these last four years. <laughs> met a lady today, Church of Christ. Oh, you'll never win it. I didn't win her. You'll never win a church of Christ. Well, you, the reason you won't win them usually is because they won't look at the book. Mm. But she said, you know, well, what about falling from grace? What about if you fall from grace? I said, ma'am, did you know where that's at in the Bible? You know, oh, yeah, she knew it, Richard. She knew it. She didn't know it. Even church of Christ, they don't even know all their six verses, a lot of them. You know, they got about six. Really, that's why they got six in the do, 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 do. And I said, well, where's falling from grace in the Bible? She didn't know. See, you don't have to be afraid of them. I showed her. I got to show her. That's a, a miracle. I said, right here, Galatians 5, 4. Look at the people that are falling from grace. And she looked at it, but, you know, she didn't see it. Duh. Didn't see it. I said, Who's, it says, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are falling. I said, ma'am, you see that? That's a person justified by the law. Right. She said, well, I don't understand that. I said, can you be justified by the law? And she knew that. No, she said, you can't. Well, that's a person justified by the law. And she was wondering, well, then why was it worded that way? Because Paul preached to them salvation through grace, and those people would not leave justification by the law. They went back to the law, and they fell from the grace that Paul offered them. See? And I explained that to her. I thought, you know, I got I'm going to win a church of Christ lady here. Her husband came. Oh boy. What are you doing here? Well, you know, I was showing your wife a talking about falling from grace, you know. Oh, we don't argue the Bible. You know, you don't argue the Bible. No way. You're not supposed to argue the Bible. Hit the road. And I, I didn't get a chance to give them some scriptures, you know. Earnestly contend for the faith. Hey, duh. <laughs> Paul disputed with them daily in the synagogues, right? Yeah. Man, if you're going to argue politics, why not argue the Bible? <laughs> but I didn't get a chance. But see, she didn't know any scripture. Folks, when you knock on somebody's door, if you're a Bible student or a member of Bible Baptist Church, 99 times out of 100 or more, you're going to know more Bible than the person on the other side of that door. Mm -hmm. See, well, how come, I, how, come I, you don't, how come I don't go soul winning? I know why you don't go soul winning. Because you're afraid. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. You're afraid. You know what you need to do? Take a step of faith. Get you a soul winner or a witness that knows how to do it. Go with them a few times. And then when you're ready, you break the ice and you try it yourself. And then you know what happens? You'll get a little bit more comfortable. You'll win your first soul to Christ. And then the process repeats itself. And you might help somebody else down the road and you've got a chain of soul winners. One, two, three. You say, what did Peter do? Peter took a step of faith. Not many, many people are willing to take that first step of faith. Give me something else about walking on water spiritually victorious overcomers. What's not a big deal to some people might be a big victory for you. Now, I don't know if you say, where do you get that from? Well, our two examples of people walking in the water right here, who's walking on the water? Peter, and who else? Jesus Christ. Now, with Jesus Christ, is that a big deal? Him walking on the water? No. If you look at John 6 and Mark 6, he's been, they've been rowing for 25, 30 furlongs, and if I go back to my old horse racing days, Eight furlongs to a mile. See, I know furlongs. I lost a lot of money on furlongs <laughs> when I was lost. Okay. But I know that's about, it's almost three miles, somewhere around three miles. Eight, eight furlongs to a mile. So it's no big deal. He might have been walking backwards. He might have been doing it. No big deal to Jesus Christ. It's God walking on water is not a big deal. But to Peter, that one step, maybe he only took one step and he's walking on the water or two. That's a big deal to Peter. Now let me put that to me and you. You know, some of you, and, and me included, we look up to people like Dr. Ruckman and the old-time saints like Carey and Judson. And you got to have your balance when you look at those people. See? You look at them, and you look up to them, 
because what God did through them, and that's good, and you try to emulate some of what, and you want to be like them, that's good. But you've got to start in the spiritual condition you're in right now. Don't you try to read your Bible through ten times this year if you're not reading it 15 minutes a day now. Okay? You can't do that. When God led those Jews, you know, after the Exodus, and he led them, he didn't lead them to the land of the Philistines right away, right? You know why? Because he was afraid that war would break out and they weren't ready to handle the war against the Philistines. So he led them in the wilderness 40 years and he put them step by step. He's trying to increase their faith and trust in God. What's a big deal for somebody else? Uh, it might not be a big deal for you and vice versa. So don't try to accomplish, you know, what some great person did if you're not where you're supposed to be as a child of God. Example, first time I read through my Bible. I, I, I had graduated in 1971 from high school and when I got down here to uh, Pensacola in 1989 to go to Bible school for 18 years or actually back up a little bit when I got saved in uh, what was it 86 I went to I graduated from high school in 71 so for 15 years after high school until I got saved for 15 years I never read a book never I read Sports Illustrated Field and Stream I watched TV and movies I was a typical American but I never read a book 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 and then I got saved and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a confession. I might have already made it before, but I got saved and for the first year and a half, two years. I didn't read the entire Bible. I read a lot of New Testament, a lot of it, and I listened to a lot of Bible tapes, but I never read my Bible cover to cover until the second year of PBI. And Dr. Ruckman said, you preachers, if you're going to preach to people the Bible, you better be reading the Bible yourself cover to cover. And boy, I got convicted, and I started reading my Bible cover to cover. But the first time I got that book out, and I saw those 1,500 babies, no pictures. <laughs> and I was used to pictures. Yeah, yeah. And 1,500 pages in Sports Illustrated, that's about maybe 70. I don't know what it is. And I'm thinking, man, this, this is, this is going to take me forever. And I started reading that thing, and I'd read it 15 minutes a day. And I'd go 30. And then I'd work up, and I sometimes maybe an hour a day, I'd read that Bible. And I got to Revelation, and man, I said, you know what, I almost got it. Once I got to Revelation 20, uh, was it 22? I'm all excited. Revelation 22. I got to the last chapter and boom, I finished that book. Is there 22 chapters in Revelation? Yes, yeah. I thought there was. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many mistakes the kind you can make with the preaching. And I, I read the last one and even so come Lord Jesus and I closed that book and I said, you know what? I did. And I found out the next time I read it through it was a little bit easier. Next time, a little bit easier. I started marking when I read my Bible and I read my Bible a lot of times. But see, the first time I went through that Bible, that was a victory for me. You know what I believe a Christian ought to do? I believe you ought to relish your victories. See? The Bible says, what's the psalm say? The hymn, one hymn book says, the psalm says, victory unto victory. See? When you get a victory for you, it might, see, Dr. Ruckman, when I read my Bible through the first time, I didn't go to him and say, look at that. I read my Bible through one time. <laughs> He's already been through it maybe 80 to 100 times in 1989. It wouldn't have been a big deal to him. But it was a big deal to me. Where are you at in your Christian life? That's where you need to start your growth right from there. Number three, about walking on water, about doing something that God wants you to do, you got to be willing to take a chance on failure. you got to be willing to take a chance on failing. I don't like to fail. Maybe you do. But you know, my Bible says all those disciples got into the ship and only one of them came out. And that was Peter. You know why the others didn't come out? You know, fear, of course. You know what they're afraid of? Sinking, yes. But they're afraid of failing. Yeah. When I candidated at church, it was 1995. <coughs> And the first thing when I candidate, if you ever candidate for a church, well, you're in for a long day. You better pack your, you know, your, your groceries and everything else and stuff to drink because they will grill you. And they grill me after the morning service, and they grill me in the evening, grill me in the summertime. They just grill, grill, grill. And I was worn out. And we got back to the motel room, and I, my, my flesh told me, you can't do it physically. I just can't do it. It's just too much. I mean, you just, you know, you know chicken. You know, you got spring chicken. You, you, you just, you just can't do it. And I prayed about that thing, and I knew God had called me to preach, and that was the only open door, duh, it makes it a little bit easier. And God said, you know, so I listed the pros and cons. I, I probably shouldn't even have done that, you know, why I should do it, what, you know, this and that. And after a while, I had no more excuse, and I said, you know what, Lord, I don't think I can do it physically. I, I really doubt it. I think I'm going to fall flat on my face, but I'm going to give it a try. So I went like this. I said, I'll take it. I called him up. And for 10 years, and then after 10 years of seeking counsel, I thought it was I should turn it over to another man for, for a number of spiritual, I thought spiritual, scriptural reasons. But for 10 years, 
I did that thing, and looking back on that thing, I don't know how I did, how I could have done it. It's because of him. That's how I did it. You know how you do something for the Lord? You gotta walk by faith. You gotta take that first step. And if it doesn't look like you can do it, but see, if you're sure God wants you to do it, and you've prayed, read your Bible, sought your counsel, and then go to your pastors. They're wise men. And then when you all those things line up and there's no reason not to do it, if it doesn't look like you can do it, take a step of faith and do it. You say, well, what happens if I fail? You didn't fail. You don't fail. Uh, you know, if you do what God tells you to do, I don't think you fail. Amen. I think you might come short of some people's expectations, yeah. but I don't worry about that. See, I don't. Worry, I want to please God, and if I do the best thing, that's that's all they care about. You know, the world's the world's an amazing place. These lost people in the world, they take chances, and Christians won't. Yeah, they take right. chances. You ever watch the Olympics or the wide world of sports? I used to like that. Dun, dun, you know, thrill of victory, and they'd always show this ski jumper going down this. 200, I don't know how long that ramp is, and they go down that ramp there, and they sometimes in, in some of the competitions they do flips and stuff like that, and I think, how do you practice that, much less do it? <laughs> what, do you break your neck five times until you get there? I don't get it. So I don't do it, and I've never tried it. <laughs> but a lot of people, they take chances for what they believe in, you know that? Um, listen, one time, um, and I, I know you're not, I guess you're not an opera buff singer, I'm not an opera buff, but I was listening one time, it was Robert Goulet, or Richard Kiley or some operatic type singer, and he's singing this song. You've heard the song. The dream, the impossible dream. You've heard that song? To right the unrightable wrong. And he's going on like something's really important happening here, you know? And at the end of that song, he sings something like this. To reach the unreachable star. <laughs> everybody claps and everybody gets excited. That guy, you know, that's it looks like he's just... That's, he's just talking about the Crusades or some earth-shaking experience. You know what that song's about? It's from Man of La Mancha, I believe. It's about Don Quixote. It's a deranged, mentally disturbed knight riding a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's singing about. You know, a guy puts his pathos and he puts his heart into that thing. And lost people take willing to take chances and put their life on the line sometimes. And you know what the problem with some people, some of God's people? They quit taking chances. You know, you know what some of you quit doing? You quit dreaming. You know, when I was a kid, I used to dream. And my life was, you know, I'm, I'm a typical, I guess, Midwestern. You know, I only had a, two or three things I did all the time. But my life was sports and fishing when I was growing up. That's all I did. And I ate, you know. <laughs> and I slept, too. <laughs> but I, sports and fishing, that was my life. You know, that's, that's about all I did. But I had dreams. My dreams were usually, you know, wild things. I dreamt one time... I used to watch hockey, and I liked the hockey fighters. I just, I don't, I just, it's gruesome, but I like them. I, I, and I dreamt, I dreamt this one time. I dreamt that I whipped. I got it written down here somewhere. I can't find my notes. Really, uh, I think I, I, uh, I whipped Bob Probert. He was a good fighter for the Red Bull. He died a while ago. Uh, Dave Brown. He was a Philadelphia fighter. These were the great, some of the greatest. And Wendell Clark. And I whipped them all in one game. Every yeah. single one. Of them. And you know what's more, more miraculous about that? They were on three different teams. <laughs> Uh, no, you only have two teams playing in one game, okay? And I was on the fourth team. Obviously, I wasn't fighting my own teammates. So I didn't try to figure that dream out. But I did miraculous things in my dreams. And when I got saved, I still dream now and then, don't you? What's wrong with dreaming? A scriptural, spiritual dream. Yeah, you know, I dream sometimes. I used to dream this. I, don't, I, I, I doubt it'll ever come true. It probably never will. But I used to dream. Maybe some preachers do. I dreamed I was preaching blows. Did you ever dream that, preachers? You can say that. <laughs> Haven't you ever dreamed that? I'm dreaming I'm, I'm preaching a blowout. And it's one of the greatest blowouts ever. <laughs> that's that's a, little, a little flesh is getting <laughs> And I'm preaching and kids are coming and I'm signing their Bibles, you know. <laughs> and this is more exciting to me. I'm going over the preacher's houses and eating with the preacher. I always wanted to eat with those preachers as well. I was always wanting to just sneak up in there and, and go to lunch. Let's go to lunch with them one time. <laughs> and I, I get to go to Dr. Oakland's house and I'm in there. I just pet his dog. <laughs> I haven't done that. <laughs> but all that other stuff, that's all a dream. But there's nothing wrong with dreaming like that. You know, as long as you realize God's will is paramount over yours, it hasn't been God's will for me to do that. But see, when you're dreaming things that you want to please God and serve God with, those are good dreams. You know why some Christians don't see the miraculous in their life like they used to back then? Quit dreaming. Quit dreaming. Everything is too practical. Well, you know, you've got to make a living. That's what the lost people say. Well, you know, I've got to make at least $13 an hour. That's what the lost people think. You know that? Yeah. 
well, you know, I gotta wait till I'm about 30, you know, I gotta get a wife, and I gotta do that. And if you look at some of your excuses for not taking a step of faith for God, a lot of our excuses, the same excuses the world uses, you know? Yeah, that's right. Christians quit dreaming. Not too many people are willing to take a chance on failing. I don't like to fail, but you know how I've, everything I've learned in life, just about everything I've learned on the, on the athletic field where I spent most of my life, I've learned by failing. I'd stick him around, and I can't get around the guy, I can't get around the guy, I can't get around the guy, and then I figure out an angle, and one time, I finally get around him. See, I grew by failing. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. Let me say something else. If you want to be a water walker, ignore what others say you can't do. Do what God says you can't. Now, I'm supposing here a little bit, and I'll say that so you know it's not doctrine I'm teaching, but Peter gets out of the ship, we know that. Everybody else is scared. Do you think anybody encouraged Peter to do it? I mean, maybe they didn't tell him he couldn't do it, but maybe they did. I don't think anybody encouraged Peter to do it. Well, for one thing, if Peter does it, it makes them look bad, doesn't it? Where's John at, the apostle that Jesus loved? Where is he? He didn't have the faith Peter had right here. Amen. He won up John here. I don't think any of them encouraged Peter to do that. I, I, I'm just supposing I wouldn't be surprised if some of them said it's impossible, Peter. You can't do it. No, Peter, it's a trick. He's the angel of light. You know, it's, it's the devil transformed as the angel. Don't do it! But I don't think anybody encouraged Peter to do what God told him to do. And Jesus, God told Jesus to do it, right? Peter said, bid me come out of the water. And what did Jesus say? He said, come. He was telling Peter what to do. Peter did it. You know, in your life, some people are going to tell you that you can't get victory over certain sin. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. You know, I have this... I have this, it's not a theory, I think it's a fact, but my theory is no sin is undefeatable. None! You know how I know that? 1 John 2, 1. It says, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin what? No. Not. Isn't that the perfect will of God? The perfect will of God is not to sin. Therefore, when I pray for victory over sin, I know I'm praying in the perfect will of God. How many times do you know that for sure when you're praying? Not always. Amen. God is faithful and not suffer you to be tempted on that you're able with temptation to make a way to escape. You may be able to bear it. God will make a way to escape. That's in the Bible. I know that. He's faithful to help me. Philippians 4.13, one of my favorite verses, and sometimes it's one of my least favorite because I don't practice it. I can do all things through Christ with strength and faith. Do you believe that? That means any sin problem you get in your life, you can get the victory over, right? Amen. You don't believe that, son? Yeah. I believe it. I'm not saying I'm sinless, but I know one thing. God's given me the road to get victory over that sin if I'll take it. You got a sin, you got a problem with your mouth. Some of you got a problem with what comes out. God can give you victory over that. You gossip. Some of you have a problem with what goes in. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But God can give you victory over that. He can give you victory over the eyes, the lust of the eyes, covetousness, your hands, your feet, your ears, your heart. Some of you got a rotten attitude. I'm just throwing that out because I know I had somebody. I've had people with rotten attitudes all the time. Bitter, 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 bitter. God can give you victory over that bitterness. I don't believe it. You, you quit believing God for miracles. You say, well, preacher, I, I lost a husband, or I lost a father, or I lost some kids, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna be stewing in my juices the rest of my life, and there's nothing I can do about it. There's something God can do about it. Amen. He can give you victory over that sin. I believe God wants us to shoot for sinless perfection, and every time we fall, confess it, forsake it, and shoot for it again. Amen? Amen. Peter's walking to Jesus Christ and there's a storm on the sea. And when he's walking to Jesus Christ, I believe there's a narrow path. There's only a, there's a path of calm between him and Jesus Christ. It might have been three or four feet, I don't know. But I believe Peter, if he stayed in that path and he stayed and he quit looking around, and if he stayed walking, I believe he'd have made it right to Jesus Christ. Might have been, he might, they might have walked 25 or 30 furlongs hand in hand if he did not. But see, he had to walk along that narrow path right to Jesus Christ. You know why some of you don't get victory over sin? Because victory over certain types of sin, you've got to walk a narrow path. You got an addiction in here? I have not Don't tell me God can't give victory over sin. I was a drunk and an alcoholic when I could say You know what God did? He said, you spend time in that book, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. You spend time in that book, you pray, and he didn't tell me in an audible voice, but he impressed upon my heart, I will give you victory over that. And the number one sin he dealt with me was alcohol. My parents and my family, they looked at me and they said, you know, he's a lifelong drunk. They runs in the family. They, they knew I was never going to get quit, quit that stuff. In two weeks, never drank again. Never wanted it. I don't want it. I had a problem with gambling. Dr. Rucker used to talk about those paramount sins where people sometimes never get the victory in the top three or four or five. I had them. 
How does it gain a book? You say, what did God do? He took it away, just like that. With prayer and time in that book. Don't you tell me God can't take you over sin. Ignore what others say you can't do, and do what God says you can do. You get victory over sin. I'll give you one here, and this is a modern day illustration. Don't get victory, give you victory over this. If you're addicted to this, you know, nothing wrong with sending a text, but if you're addicted to anything, we're not supposed to be borrowing the power any, right? He right. said you free from it. See, Brother Donovan said he wouldn't preach on cell phones. I didn't make that promise. <laughs> so he can set you free if it's a problem. See, why aren't people getting victories like that, preacher? Because they're paying too much attention to what other people say they can't do. And not doing what God says you can't do. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus, right? You say, why did God have Peter walk on the water? I got my speculations, but I'll use... This is another little speculation, but I think there's Bible precedent for it. I think, uh, I think it's number six, I don't know, number five. I don't know who counts. <laughs> But when you're going to walk on the water and walk by faith, God wants to use your step of faith to influence somebody else to do likewise. You know, Peter's walking to Jesus, right? He wants to get I'm, I'm not adding to the Bible, but do you think Jesus wanted Peter to sink? I, I, if I know the Lord, his main objective is not for people to fail. I think he wanted Peter to succeed. I think he wanted to come right to him and stay in that path of faith and trust him all the way and grab him and say, Peter, you did it. And I'll tell you what else I think, and this is just what I think, and if you disagree, that's okay. I think when Peter made that successful step, he's going to come over here. He said, okay. You see when Peter did, okay, John, you're next. Come on. And then Andrew. I think he wanted to go all the way down the line. Don't you think so? You know, when God gives people like Adoniram Judson and William Carey, when he gives them those great victories and they do things for God, I think he does it for the sake of sinners, lost sinners, but I think he does it for the sake of saved people as an example. Right? I think so. He wants us to influence other people. See, if you're not living by faith, you're a bad influence. But when you take a step of faith, you don't know the influence you have on other people around you. We're sitting at dinner on the ground, speaking of influence, and uh, I didn't like it when this, this mother told me, but she said, you know, my son, you're his favorite hockey player. <laughs> I was thinking, why am I her favorite hockey player? I barely get around. <laughs> but I must have gave him a pass and set him up for a goal. But anyway. And she said, he watches you, and he, you're his favorite player. And I was just kind of laughing, and I said, wait a minute, whoa. He's watching me, and I'm not worried about the, the sticks and the backhand. He's watching my attitude, my sportsmanship, my temper, whoa, my mouth, when I get a little bit mouthy. You know, ever since then, I, I try to remind myself when that guy's playing, he watches, you're an influence on him, he's watching you. You know, you influence other people, Christians, whether you want to or not. You going to take a step of faith and be a good influence? <coughs> Are you going to live by sight and not by faith? And don't take a step of faith. Uh, next point, let me give you two more points and we'll close. About walking on water. What you couldn't do by yourself, you can do with the Lord's help. Amen. What you can't do by yourself, you can do with the Lord's help. Amen. You say, Preacher Peter saying, yes he did. Look at verse 30. Verse 30 says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come to the ship, the wind ceased. So the Lord saved him, and what the Lord did, I, well, it looks like, if you compare the companion passages, I guess he just picked him up, grabbed him by the hand, and Peter was back on top, back on top of the water. You know, you'd be surprised what you and God can do that you can't do by yourself. Amen. You, know the, you know the world, the world copies the Bible all the time. In a little town in Pennsylvania one time, I'm walking, and I'm, you know, just, I don't know what I'm doing or I'm praying and stuff like that at a mall, one of those malls where you walk around. And I hear a song, and I can tell right away it's a country song. You know you can tell a country song because they have Adam's apple disease? <laughs> I don't know what it is with country singers. Like, oh, hey, you know, they all get, you get this little Adam's apple. You ever heard country singers? You tell me? They all sing the same little, they do something wrong with their Adam's apple. I don't know what it is. It's not like Yodel or something. But it's a, it was a duet. I don't know if it was Brooks and Dunn or... Sonny and Cher, who knows, I don't know what it was. But it was some duet. And they're singing, and I didn't pay much attention to the song. And then they, they were singing Bible. <coughs> they sing Bible sometimes, you know, that lost people. And here's what they were singing. I wrote the words down here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, uh, let's see if I'm good. I can try. Here it is, okay. It says, uh, you and me, we can walk on water, baby. If I'm lying, I'm dying. He's, and then they got a bunch of stuff, and it says, it's not always going to be easy, but together, you and me, baby, we can walk on water. 
And I'm thinking to myself, because you know, I used to like that kind of stuff, but as a born again Christian, I'm thinking, here's to a man and a woman, and they're probably lost. They're probably not even married. I mean, a lot of your, you know, duh, the, a lot of those couples in the songs are not married, okay? I hate to bust your bubble. <laughs> but they might not be married. They might be, you know, wicked sinners, but they think as long as they stay together, they can walk on water and do anything. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a shame to me and you sometimes? If they think they can do anything, they don't even know God. Really? And we know the God of the universe, and we've got the promises of God in writing, which they don't know or they don't believe. And if God says we can do it, and you can do it, and God gives you a command, and he's right there in you and with you to help you do it, how come we can't walk on water and most people can? You're shame on us, you know that? You know I'm not talking about physically walking on water. I mean, we're not charismatics here. But at the same time, God still works in miracles. He's, you know, he's still changing characters. I tell you, when I'm around my relatives, I had a buddy call me uh, a few months ago, and he's gotten saved since then, thank God, through his brother's witness, mostly. And I'm talking on the phone, trying to witness him. He said, he said, you're, you're different. He said, you're not like you. What happened to you? And I got to tell him what Jesus Christ did for me. You know, maybe a lot of lost people are not getting saved because they don't see a lot of what Jesus Christ has done for professing saved people. Amen. Some of you, maybe you're still doing the same things you used to do when you were lost. Smoking your cigarettes. Drinking your beer. Oh, a little bit of wine don't hurt, preacher. Hurt your testimony. It destroys your testimony. Sure. Well, you know, I, I still like the same old, you know, the same old body shows and the body movies. I, well, then, maybe something's wrong. Maybe you're not walking by faith. Yeah. See? See, I'm saying what you can't do by yourself, you can do with the Lord's help. You can do it. Let me give you one more thing. The Bible says that Peter walked on water. I'm going to give you another supposition, but I think I'm true on this, and you can look it up later. I think, I'm going to say this, once you've done it the first time, you can do it again. You can do it again. Yeah. You see, where do you see that about Peter? Look at verse 29. It says, when Peter was come down out of the water, he come down out of the ship, he walked on the water, right? Okay. Verse 31, Jesus stretched forth his hand. I'm paraphrasing. He caught him. I guess he's got him back on the water. How'd they get back in the ship? Oh, I just think he, and you could be right. I think he just teleported him. <laughs> now, he could have done that. Lazarus came out of there. He was bound hand and foot, so... Obviously, Lazarus, I guess he kind of floated him up. I don't know. But you read Mark 6 sometime. You look to John 6. The Bible says Jesus came up into them out of the water. That means when he's coming up into them, sounds to me like he's walking right back to the ship, and he climbs up the ladder and back into the ship. You know what I think happened? And if you don't believe it, that's, that's up to you. I think Peter did it twice. First time, without the Lord's hand, by faith for Luke, he sang. Second time, the Lord had him by the hand. He had all the faith in the world. I think they walked hand in hand right back over the water and into that ship. First time I read through my Bible, you know what that told me? That told me I could do it again. The first time I led a soul to Jesus Christ, I didn't think I'd ever do it. I didn't think I'd ever get one led to Christ because I was so shy and so backward, so fearful. But when I got that first soul, it helped me win another one. I knew I could do it again. When I got a victory over people I always worried about, you know, that. God, you can't get victory over homosexuality or this sin or that. Well, I've never had that sin problem. But I, but I think I think God can give victory over if they want it. Amen. He gave me victory over alcohol. You know what that did? That gave me victory over gambling. That helped me. That helped me get victory over my temper. God went on and on down the line. Every time I got a victory, it gave me confidence. If I did it once, I can do it again. I believe that. See, are you a positive thinker? Yes, I am. I'm very positive about God. I'm very negative about the world. I know where the world's going. I understand that. And I'm not out to try to save the world. I want to save one here and one there. But I want to be the person that God wants me to be. Yeah. And if he's given me a victory, and I've done it once, I know I can do it again. Let me close with an illustration. It's a sports one, so please, I'm sorry, that, but that's, that's, that's what I grew up on. Uh, I was watching, a, uh, we don't get cable in our house, so I went over to a relative's house, and they let me watch a baseball game. I don't get to watch many baseball games. It was, Cardinals. I'm from St. Louis. They've been in the news a lot because they've been winning. It was, the, it was the fifth game against the Washington, uh, whatever they're called, Nationals. Two games apiece. And the Cardinals went behind six to nothing in the second inning. They're losing six to nothing. My wife says, I guess you, you want to come home early with me? And I said, no, let me stay for one inning. So I said, well, I'll see what one or two innings. They got one run the next inning at six to one. I said, well, I'll stay for another inning. Usually you don't come back from six runs. It's six to two. 
fourth, fifth inning, it's six to They just chip away. One, one, one. It gets to the eighth inning. It's six to five, Washington. They've blown five runs at the six run lead. Cardinals were batting. Top of the eighth. They got a base hit. I said, well, a home run put us ahead. We'll make it seven six. And the guy got, they got one guy on base. Next guy came up. He made it out. I think the next guy came up. He made it out two outs. Two outs. Come. And I, I forget to tell you, Washington got another run in there. It's seven to five. They're losing by two. Cardinals have a man on third, two out, and I'm thinking, boy, it's either a home run or we go home. Batter gets up, gets strike two on him, I'm thinking, one strike and the game's over. Ball one, ball two, ball three, ball four, he walks, he's got two runners on him, I'm thinking, we've got a chance. Next, I'm telling you, David Freeze comes up, the exact same thing, gets two strikes, ball one, two, three, four, he walks, and so they were down to two strikes, the last strike was twice, and they got bases loaded. Here comes a hitter that's not a very good hitter. That's 225 during the year. The scals were some second base or something. He's not a hitter. He comes up with the bases loaded, they're losing by two. He gets a line drive and hits the shortstep, bounces off the glove in the center field. Two runs scored, it's tied up. I think this is crazy. This is crazy. A rookie comes up. You've got a man steals second, you got second and third, two up. A rookie, a rookie shortstop, he comes up for the Cardinals. He hits a line drive to right field, gets a base hit or a double. Two run score, and they're winning. They won nine to seven. And I looked at it and I said, man, that was like the best comeback ever in that type of a series in the history of baseball, I think. And I'm thinking to myself, how could a team do that and not quit? And then they rattled off a statistic. It was, it was something. In the last six series, the Cardinals have been in over the last two years, they've been in an elimination game six times. You lose, you're out. And they won every one of those games six times and won that series. You know what that tells me? I think when they won the first one, that was enough two years ago. But once they got to the next series, you know what they're thinking? We did it, we did it once, we can do it again. Folks, that's how athletes think. They feed on that momentum. And once they got to the sixth time, they said, well, we've got five precedences. We've done it five times in a row. We can do it again, and they did it. You know what lots of people do sometimes? They put us to shame. They do miracles, almost, in a sense. <laughs> they live a life of faith, and they're lost things, they're idols and their money and their, their faith is in the wrong things, but you got to credit them they have faith. But let me tell you this, if you're living, if you're not living a life of faith, if you've got one victory, you get another one. Some of you used to be soul winners, you can be soul winners again. Some of you used to walk by faith and claim the promises. You remember that when you believe the promises of God? You can believe it. Some of you maybe you felt called for God to do something in your life, and maybe you just put the call on the back burner, but you what's still there, and you can do it. Once you walk on water step by faith the first time, you can do it again. Let's pray. Lord, I pray God, you might bless the message. Let me help someone in here, Lord. Help us to walk by faith. And, uh, we're practical. We understand where we're at, what age we're at. But help us not to shut you out and not negate your power by uh, denying the scripture. Help us to walk by faith and do the things you want us to do.